Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, Secure Software Factory, adding SBOM and code signing to your security checks. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm gonna read our code of conduct and then hand over to Ariel Schuper, engineering product manager at Cisco and Shai Simbaum, senior developer at Cisco. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to speak as an attendee, but there is a chat box on the right-hand sidebar of your screen. Please feel free to drop all your questions for Ariel and Shai there. We'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. And basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They are also available via your registration link and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand things over to Ariel and Shai to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, and we won't talk about, of course, the hot topic of security software factory. So we'll talk about some background on supply chain security, where it started, the big things around it. Noise lately. Uh, we'll talk about the different where to use them. And then we'll put a special focus on some open source tools. Uh, that are dedicated for the runtime aspect of the supply chain security. But let's first start with talking about like what it is or why we are all concerned from software supply chain recently. So I think, you know, software supply chain security was always an issue. It was always kind of a, something that people can temper. It was like a, a rumor that things can go wrong and things can change. And in Docker Hub, there were many kind of malicious things, you know, container images. But I think the turning point was towards the end of 2020 when uh, the solo win attack, you know, took place. Uh, it was a massive attack that, you know, started somewhere in 2018, and it took almost 15 months just to discover uh, this attack. And solo wins uh, is a software manufacturer uh, that uh, was breached, and malicious actors uh, manipulated the software update that it produces. They added malicious code into uh, the update while the update was built. So when the software was delivered to all the 18,000 SolarWind customer, it was signed and verified, but no one and no one even considered the fact that SolarWind was breaching in such a way that someone, you know, uh, inserted malicious code and consequently all the 18,000 custom, you know, SolarWind customers were infected and got hit by this attack, which was, you know, super sophisticated and this is why it took like almost 15 months to discover it. This special uh, command and control protocol and mechanism was really impressive. But nevertheless, there was a, the most, the first most significant uh, supply chain attack, which had a huge uh, monetary consequences for SolarWinds and all the other, you know, customers that been using their system. Now, I'm calling it a turning point, but if you look at the timelines and you look about between 2015 and 2020, you know, almost, you know, five years or six years of small amount of attacks. And since 2020, and we are now almost towards the end of 2022, but still we have a uh, good, you know, good, you know, a third of a year to go. Um, you see the amount of attacks is just, you know, really increasing significantly. So, yes, software becoming a target. Um, it's easy to target it. Um, some software really use. I mean, the code curve you can see here in the middle was another famous attack that had a huge impact on a lot of uh, customers. And the understanding that it's much easier to penetrate users through the software they consume uh, became a noticeable fact that you know today is one of the facto uh, popular risk and attack that need to be considered. Now, there's more attack, there's more risk. Obviously, there's also some more uh, standards and regulation uh, that, which are emerging. So I think the most notable one was the presidential order that anyone who wants to sell to the U.S. government needs to uh, stand or provide proof to the, to the software supply chain uh, that it produced. But much beyond that, there is a salsa 
which is an OpenSSF pro project uh, that aiming to provide secure software, secure open source software. Uh, Denise generated their code of conduct and their recommendation uh, on how to secure uh, software supply chain. Microsoft is its initiative, and even the CNCF as a reference architecture uh, and a diagram of the best uh, practices uh, to secure software supply chain. So definitely there's a hot topic, different a lot of, you know, both regulations, standards, you know, even just recommendation which with no you know superpower but again there is a proliferation of uh recommendation and document that trying to address this aspect so let's talk about what it is and what do we secure so sort of supply chain is a process you know that cover your uh that cover your uh code development it starts when developer code uh, when the code is built, and of course, when the code is is running in any, uh, you can temper uh, and you can modify and add your malicious code. Now, obviously, as you can see uh, from this diagram, all those like small icons of uh, hackers. Oh, Ariel, are, I'm sorry, uh, I'm gonna break places. in real quick. I don't think you're sharing your screen just yet. Oh, thank you, so Libby. I'm not seeing that slide. Point. Sorry, I was just thinking. I don't. I think he's still introing. So there we go. Thank you, Libby. Sorry. You're welcome. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So thanks for this note. So yep, let's talk about those are the amount of attacks which I mentioned, the standards, different standards, and let's talk about you know the, the, the supply. So thank you, Libby, and I apologize, Ludens, for, for stop sharing just before the beginning of the show. I didn't mind it. I'm keep sharing my screen. I'm sorry for that. So when you look about, you know, the supply chain, you look about, you know, where you can hack uh, the code. So obviously you can see those small icons of uh, hackers, uh, you know, with the hoodie. It should be also black, but never mind. Um, you can see it usually being, you know, being sent to build a system in the build system with the dependencies when it's sent to, you know, to the, to the different uh, registry before it's being pushed to deployment, even post deployment. Uh, those are the places where you know uh, the code can be uh, changed and modified. So through the entire life cycle of the code, from the time that the developer wrote the wrote the code and all the way until the time that the code is running, those are the areas, the potential uh, locations where people can, where malicious actors can intercept the code, modify, change, and add their uh, malicious packages. Now. The biggest focus area is, you know, on the build process because this is probably where you generate the most amount of and which focusing on, you know, how you making sure that you're getting the build provenance and how do you do, you know, maintain version control and authentication of the build and how every step can be auditable and the integrity of the different steps and probably the most tough uh, recommendation is how you making sure that the build is hermetic uh, and it's reproducible so if you can run in two parallel build systems they will reproduce the same exact you know uh, artifact so all those aspects are targeting uh, the build environment and making sure that the build process by itself um, is secure and is not tempered um, which makes perfect sense but we need to understand that just securing the build is not enough right and well, you can argue and say that when developer is, you know, writing his code, it's probably inside the organization, whether it's, you know, inside their ground or connected to the network, it's probably when the code is running, um, it's also can be tempered. And there is also a play that uh, can be changed and need to be uh, taken into consideration. And the purpose of this talk today is to really focus on these aspects on how do we increase the security level, the supply chain security level of our runtime environment? So when you talk about, you know, building blocks in software supply chain, so one of the, the first item is the software bill of material, right? Or what's known as SBOM. And the reason why the SBOM generates so much interest and a lot of, I uh, probably heard it a lot and in many places is because it offers some transparency level into the, the, the executable that you're running. So if I'm getting an executable and I'm running it, I have no idea what's coming in. 
if I get the software bill of material and I see all different, you know, li libraries and dependencies and everything which the code is built from, I get better visibility, I get better transparency into what I'm using, which of course is super important when there are some, you know, uh, critical vulnerabilities, but even without it, it we have some. It's not just like having a food. Uh, you want to know what exactly the food that you are eating uh, is made out of. The same thing it relates to the software which you're using. You want to know what is the nutrition fact table of this software. This is what uh, S1 can provide. And why is it good? Because it gives you some indication on the maturity level of the security program of the software, uh, the software state. How is it maintained? Uh, is it usable? Uh, is it supported? You know, is it outdated or not? It also give you very important information about uh, vulnerabilities level. So vulnerabilities are based on packages. And if you get the full list of the packages, you can see which one of them is vulnerable and vulnerable to what. Uh, and also from compliance perspective, there's the information about the licenses, the open source, which are used. And you can get yourself uh, or at least get the uh, compliance uh, fulfilled with understanding if all the packages you are using are compliant with the organization uh, policies. Now, as well as different formats, there are SPDX and Cyclone DX. Okay, uh, the SPDX is pushed by the Linux Foundation, the Cyclone Linux by the OWASP. Uh, while the SPDX is more focused on licenses view and seeing what licenses are being used, uh, the Cyclone DX, in my opinion, is uh, much more impressive. Um, it's security oriented, so there's a lot, a lot of good uh, security metadata uh, in the S bomb that produces with the second DX format. So if you look about CVEs and exploitability and, you know, uh, 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 remediation, really very useful information. It also supports all the advanced programming languages. You know, it's ext extensible, you can extend it, it's pretty proof. It's really, um, at least in my opinion, it's a very impressive uh, format or provide that good, useful information. Now, generating SVOM is typically something you do in your CI, okay, uh, because this is where you produce your software. But generating SVOM of your runtime environment has some significant advantages. I think probably all the audience uh, recall the log4j fire drill. Uh, and if you really want to get an accurate snapshot of all the effective CVEs and where in your uh, environment you have, you know, critical items like log4j, um, then it's really good to know uh, what's running in your environment. Uh, also, exploitation insights, right? So just log4j was, you know, rushing to replace it, but there were many places in which the log4j was not even exploitable. Um, and then, then it was uh, replacing and, and, and bringing down those services. So the, it's good to understand and to see the context of where it is run, uh, where you have it. And also if you want to get, again, a good compliance uh, to the policy of the open source policies that in your organization, um, it's good to know what is running in your environment. Uh, and the Cube Clarity, this is this like beautiful icon, you know, on the top, uh, is an open source tool that Cisco donated uh, and contributed to the to the community um, and generate dynamic S bomb in Kubernetes clusters. Let's take a look. Uh, just a minute. Let's take a look on the other side. Let me continue. Okay. Yep, sorry for that. Okay. So this is the Cube Clarity dashboard. I run it in my Kubernetes cluster. So I have a simple Kubernetes cluster running on GKE. I, I deployed a few uh, containers as a deployment. I used the, the stock shop uh, demo application. Uh, in order to get, and I'm just running this, you know, this dashboard, which is connected to my cluster and uh, doing port forwarding uh, for my cluster into this uh, local host. Um, in order to start seeing everything in, uh, in the dashboard, you need to start to scan. So you can schedule the scan. Uh, you can select the namespace that you want to, what names in the cluster. You can see all the list of the namespace that you have in the cluster and you can select which of them. I select the default namespace and the sock shop uh, namespace. You can decide if you want Docker CIS benchmark or not. 
uh, we'll turn it off because it's not part of the S bomb. Uh, and you can decide if you want to do it wet or no. Uh, you click save. Uh, you can all, and then you can start scanning, and then immediately it will start uh, scanning uh, scan your environment. Then you can filter everything uh, based on those scans. Now once we have this scanning, I already ran, ran this scan uh, before. You can see it by the way; it's a very fast scan. Or just you know, already done it before. You get this uh, the dashboard to start populating. Uh, you're getting to see you know uh, all the the cumulative number of vulnerabilities. How much of them hitch as a fix. Uh, you can see different packages per license, so you can, I can show well, what, how many GPL licenses I have, MIT licenses, or if I want something else. Uh, I can see the package breakdown based on programming languages. I can see how many applications I have, resources, packages. And here I can start playing with applications. I can start playing with the top vulnerable resources or even the top vulnerable uh, packages that I have. And it's sorted out by the severity, not by the code number, but by how many you know, based on the severity of the vulnerabilities. Then I can start going to the nice thing. I can check, start searching for vulnerability, you know, based on the package it exists or vice versa. I can look at the different packages uh, that are there and, and try to find, or try to find, you know, specific. I can see who's using those packages. Um, and then I can, again, check all the different uh, resources uh, and how they're being used. So it's it's very useful for me to uh, get a good visibility on whether it's licenses or vulnerabilities per package, where exactly this package is, how many are using it. So it's it's very useful because if I'm using like a base image, or, which is standardized, I want to do it once and I want to deploy it anywhere. Uh, and this is where you get this uh, uh, great, great visibility. So this is a cube clarity. Um, it's part of, it's available on GitHub uh, in the Open Clarity repo uh, where Cisco is, you know, contributing all the open source uh, to the Cloud Native open source tool uh, and we'll be happy for people to start using it uh, more and more. So this is Cube Clarity and this allows you to address, you know, SBOM aspects in runtime. But let's talk about something else. So SBOM is important, but it's not enough. We also want to make sure there is a code integrity. What does it mean code integrity? So code integrity is, of course, we want to make sure that the code isn't tempered, isn't modified, isn't changed when it was built, right? And it's not only in the build phase, but also beyond because code can temper it. I can, act, if I have access to your registry or if I have access to your, uh, where you keep, where you store your, your container, or even if I have access to your cluster, I can temper or change it doesn't have to be Kubernetes. It can be also into your cloud account. It could be into your virtual machines. It can be to your serverless functions. And the way the code signing works is, you know, you you you, you sign the code when you produce it with, you know, a cryptographic uh, signature. Then part of it is, you know, store the private key or the, the, the private signature is stored with the code, and it's pushed to the registry together with the code. So it's kind of a metadata that it pushed with the code. And then I have the public key. Uh, which is then used to validate. So in the validation phase, I'm matching the private and the public, and I can see uh, if it matches or if the code is uh, was tempered and changed. Now, one of the more interesting things that uh, I think today is uh, existing is the SIGSTOR. SIGSTOR is an open source security framework uh, that creates a new standards for signing and verifying. Uh, and it really, it's an open source, right? You can use it and it's really aimed to increase the security level of, uh, you know, software production. So it's part of the op OpenSSF, uh, the Open Source Security uh, Foundation by the Linux Foundation. And it's really a great contribution to the security of software uh, in general. Now, one of the, 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 the interesting things they introduce is a unique structure for keyless signing. So one of the challenges in uh, keyless in, in keys or the classical uh, code signing is that you have long lasting keys, they can get discovered, uh, and you can then, you know, uh, temper them. But when using keyless, this is a much safer approach. Um, and then it's primarily focused on container images, uh, and they can sign them, you know, with keyless signing, and then you can use any admission controller 
uh, so six or it's owner division controller, but you can use any, you know, OPA or uh, key very noble says also admission controllers, then they can validate that only signed and verified images uh, are being deployed in the cluster, which again is, uh, is a great tool that provide uh, any, a higher level for the, you know, the pods which are running in the cluster. But here, we want to discuss not just containers, we also want to discuss serverless functions. Uh, and while Sigstore is really focusing on containers, serverless functions is a larger security challenge. Because unlike containers, in serverless functions, there is no SHA, there's no hash that can be used in order to verify. And even if you try to do it, you know, different deployment frameworks has different way to calculate it and different things they include in the in the zip file. So it's really hard to get a unified standard, just like we have a SHA uh, for an image. And even if there was like a unified hash, um, there is no validation. So we're still missing the validation option. Now I'm saying still, I'm talking about most of the clouds. Uh, AWS has their code sign, which you know is a great service. Uh, code sign allow you to sign functions. So once this function is uploaded, uh, you can use the function. You can sign it. Uh, you can add a signing profile to tell you what to do if something doesn't match, and then you can select which lambda will get which profile. And then before the lambda is executed, uh, code sign to verify uh, the function hash that was not changed. So this is great um, but it's only post deployment and remember we want to make sure that the entire chain uh, is covered and it's slightly cumbersome or slightly hard to configure and ideally we would like to have the same concept as six door keyless signing also enabled for serverless functions so for that uh, we created function clarity and again it's an open source tool that Cisco the community uh, for serverless functions. Uh, it's extending the SIGSTORE concept also to serverless functions. So it allows users to sign the functions, which is great. I mean, you can do it without it, but it you know, added the missing point of the validation of functions. So you can really validate those functions in any cloud environment, um, and you can get it making sure that only uh, functions which were not tempered uh, are being used uh, in the cloud domain. Now, how does it work? So, when you write your service function and you're doing, after you're doing your testing, before you're making the deployment, uh, we are inserting a step into your CI uh, pipeline, and then the CI is using cosine in order to sign the image. You can use it with key pair. Uh, but you can use it with keyless, so you can create identity, get identity from full CO, uh, use this identity, you know, upload identity to the uh, to the record, or if you're using a key pair, then you can you know upload the the public key to, to the cloud account, and then in every cloud account, in, when you in, want to install Cube Clarity, there is like the infrastructure that first we need to listen to the events, we get the notification about an update or a change or a new function was created, which trigger uh, a dedicated validating lambda. So this lambda, uh, this lambda either check versus record, or if it, you're using public key, get the public key uh, and verify it with the private key of the function, and then allow you to perform actions. So if you need to decide if you want to get alert, if you want to get blocked, if you want to get notified, uh, or on the consequent action that post. Uh, the validation. So the function is valid and signed and it's correct. Thumbs up. You can move ahead. Uh, if the if the function um, is not or it's tempered, uh, then you know you can decide what you want to do with it. So this is function clarity. Um, it's going to be released soon and available in our repo. And I will be. I'm happy to invite Chai uh, to do the demo. So I'll stop sharing. Uh, and Chai, please remember to share your screen. Hey, yes, I will share my screen in a minute. Uh, so let me know when you see my screen. Not just yet. 
try again. Ah, okay, that's strange. So, uh, states that uh, the that we can't access your screen. Check your system settings and then restart your browser. Ah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Try to refresh the. All right, everybody, hang tight while he refreshes that browser and. Are there any quick questions we could maybe answer right now while we're waiting, Ariel? Or anyone in the audience have anything we could chat about while we're waiting? All right, Shai, you are still muted. I try to refresh my browser. Part okay. part of the part of the solutions here, so didn't work. All right. While you're working so, on that, Ariel, we do have a question. What should be the starting point of implementing SBOM as a part of our release? Maybe we can chat about that while we're waiting on Shai's browser. Anybody? There we go. We're getting some audience answers. Everyone bear with us just a moment. Here we go. Okay, now let me know if you there see. There it is. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so, okay. so hi everyone. So my name is Shai, and I'm from the ETNI uh, group in Cisco, where Ariel uh, is our product uh, manager. Uh, so. What I'm going to show here in this demo is I'm going to, first of all, the, the project is not yet released. So we are going to be published in, the, in several weeks. And what I'm going to show is how you can sign the piece of code in your, in your own environment. And then you, after you sign it, you, what we actually do is we generate an identity for this code. And then we sign the identity and we upload um, the certificate or uh, the signature, depending if it's a keyless uh, solution or if you decided to use key pair. So yes, we upload the, uh, the, the signed code, uh, si uh, the signed code into your uh, cloud account. At the moment, we support uh, AWS. So this will be also the context of the demo. Um, and I will show how I deploy uh, two functions, one uh, on top of the signed code and uh, another one which is not signed. And then I will show uh, how the, the, the function clarity uh, uh, rec um, is triggered. And then it realizes that the signed code is okay, but uh, the function with the unsigned code is, 
is, uh, is, was not uh, verified by function clarity. And uh, in this case, uh, we have several options. Uh, I will show how we block the function and we also uh, send the notification. Uh, in AWS context, we send it to an SNS uh, queue. And uh, I did some uh, a cool integration where it will send me an email that will notify me that uh, an unrecognized function tried to be created and it was blocked. So uh, let's start the demo. Uh, so uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sign a piece of code in my, uh, in my uh, computer. So... Uh, what happens in, in Keyless is that uh, you are authenticating yourself using one of these three options. Uh, this, um, this is the way you claim to be who you are. Uh, and once you do that, uh, we uh, use the certificate that was produced uh, from the Six Store uh, Keyless project. And uh, uh, we signed the code, and this is the certificate who signed the code, and it is registered somewhere at uh, uh, Record and Fulcio. So now that I have uh, signed the code, I'm going to create uh, two functions. Uh, one with uh, the signed code. And uh, the other one with the code which is not signed. And uh, after I do that, uh, now the functions are uh, created at uh, AWS. Uh, so this is a process that can take uh, maybe a minute or two, where the, we have uh, in AWS, the solution is to use CloudTrail that uh, sends all the events to CloudWatch. And we... Um, send those cloud, those log events into our own uh, uh, verifier Lambda. And once the, our Lambda is triggered, then uh, it will uh, process the, the function that was created and it will check um, if the function is, is verified. It will take the function, it will download its code in this case, and it will sort of reverse engineer, create the identity and then uh, we'll seek for a appropriate certificate or a signature that the code was signed with. And if it will find it, it will try to open, of, of course, the signature uh, using the, uh, the signature or the certificate. And if it's successful, then we are okay. And if not, uh, then several options here. So um, in a minute, we'll see if the if the if the events were already picked up by the our lambda and then we can uh, see the results so in case that uh, the the code is verified we will for example uh, add a tag to the function that uh, states that the, the function was uh, verified by function clarity uh, let's wait another minute and uh, in case it was not signed by us, then we will see that uh, in this case, I chose to block the function. We'll see how the function uh, is blocked from running. Um, meaning in the in case of uh, AWS, it's throttling the function. Here, as you can see, the function is throttled, meaning we reduce its concurrency to zero. And you can see that now I received an event that's stating that the function clarity alert, we failed to verify this Lambda and this is the action we took in this case. So uh, this is for in this case, and let's see that the one that is verified, yeah, we see that just we just tagged it and said, okay, this function was verified by function clarity and it's okay, it's more uh, informative. And now I can also do some cool stuff, for example, if uh, in this, in the, function that is signed, if you try, for example, to just change in the function uh, at runtime, then an update function event should be triggered. And uh, again, it would maybe take a minute or so. And then you can see how this function now that 
uh, we got the update uh, function event. We do this same process again. We try to understand whether this code is uh, signed by function clarity. And uh, if not, we will want to, uh, in this case, since the user chose to block the function, we will block this one as well. So uh, let's wait a minute or so. And if someone has questions in the meanwhile, then uh, feel free to ask. So I see a question here that states, uh, how can I get notified if an unsigned code is deployed? Uh, so how can you be notified? So we have several options of uh, post verification actions. So uh, one of the, we have uh, at the moment detect, which means let's tag the function. We have a block that states, uh, let's block the function and besides that, we have the options to send a notification to a predefined uh, queue. And from that point on, the user can decide whatever he wants to do. He can integrate with this uh, queue and do uh, whatever he wants in the case of, a, for example, unverified function. Um, I hope this answers the question. Um, So here you can see that now the function that was signed, uh, the event was picked up uh, and now uh, the function was stopped and we had a, a relevant tag as well that function is not signed. And uh, you can see here that I got, of course, another event now that the function is, um, is now uh, blocked as well. Uh, Since so someone changed the code without uh, signing it first. Um, I see that another question, if I'm showing, is, does it work for images as well? So yes, uh, the, the, new, the new thing we brought in this uh, project is uh, the, the, the code signature, but we also support image signature, which uh, harness uh, uh, six store cosine, uh, and uh, we use it to sign images as well. In case of image signing, the the signature, let's say, or the, the, the code, uh, the, the signature of the signed uh, image is lies in the repository itself where the image exists. So this is how it seeks to work when signing images. So if there aren't any more questions, then I'm done from uh, my side. Ariel, do you want to continue? Okay. Are we, what's next? Are we waiting on another presentation or should we go to, into questions? Shai, what do you think? F. I'm done with my demo of the function clarity and code signing. Uh, I guess that maybe Ariel knows if he has some uh, more topics to talk about. I'm tr right. Can you hear me? I'm trying to talk. Can you see, can you hear me or you cannot? Yes, now we can. Yes, we can hear you now. Perfect. I was trying to talk. So I'm saying that's the end of our webinar. So I have no more slides. We'll be happy to go for questions. So right. if I just want to summarize I'll just try to summarize what you know what we saw. So we talk about you know generating a runtime SBOM. Uh, Shai also did us a demo of how you create uh, signatures, how you making sure your code integrity. 
uh, is not tempered and we show it on serverless, which is a very special use cases. So if anyone in the audience has questions, we'll be happy to answer it. We'll wait for a minutes. Libby, anything from your side? Nothing from mine. Have we worked through, uh, it looks like we have worked through all the questions in the chat. Does anyone have anything else to add? Any other questions? Let's see if anybody pops anything else in. Do y'all have any links or anything you want me to add into the chat? Or do you want to add into the chat for folks to follow up or keep up, keep up with what you're yes. working on? Yes, absolutely. So definitely I would love to share here uh, the open clarity. So follow our repo, uh, function clarity, cube clarity is there. Uh, function clarity is going to be there shortly. Uh, and we, of course, would love to get users to uh, address it, you know, hear about it. Uh, and here, this, he also shared our open source uh, project uh, would be great. Okay. All right. Let's see. There is a question to address to the audience. Uh, does anyone have a requirement to expose their SBOM? And I guess anyone in the audience, feel free to respond to that in the chat. And speakers, if you have anything to add into that as well, you're welcome to. All right. If we don't have anything else and no more questions, we can wrap a little bit early. But um, Ariel and Shai, do y'all have anything else, any parting words you want to leave everyone with? Um, no, I think, you know, we covered it. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, Shai. Uh, we do want to make sure that people are keeping their environment secure uh, and just, you know, using open source, free, simple tools uh, that can keep them much more secure uh, than before. That's all from my side. Anything from your side, Shai? Uh, no. I have nothing to add. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another live webinar. Thank you to Ariel and Shai for their time and presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. Well, like I said, this will all be up on the website shortly and, um, be sure to look for another webinar or online program from CNCF this week. And thank you everyone for joining us so much.